I hope you who are on the phone patch are able to secure these books and read them and be prepared to understand the teachings on their contents. This style of writing is more or less 100 years old, but it is very clear through Ledbetter. So we're turning to the explanation of the diagram on page 171. It begins with an ovoid. The words at the top say the ego. Then there is the first aspect, the second aspect, and the third aspect. You can see the division of planes, the lowest plane being the physical on the diagram, the physical plane goes through the astral plane, the mental plane, and then we enter what is called here in theosophy the buddhic plane, which is accurate, then the nirvanic plane, the monadic plane, and the divine or adi plane. So we can look back at the diagram as we read this teaching. In my book, it's page 171. In this chapter, Ledbetter is explaining a main tenet of theosophy. He says, all manifestation is cyclic. This means that all forms of life that emanate from God in the beginning can return to him in the ending, bearing the fruits of all the experience gained through the great cycle of activity. The subtitle of the chapter, The Birth of the Ego, describes a key point in the trajectory when matter is in fired with an ego and it is able to begin the journey back home to God. Ledbetter's diagram shows three separate descents of spirit into matter. He labels these descents after the three persons of the Trinity. The first descent into matter is from the third aspect of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now this is our explanation of this diagram. So if you're looking for it, you won't find it in just these words. In the diagram, it is represented by the lowest of the three circles shown at the top of the page. This is called the first outpouring. It vivifies virgin matter and awakens it into activity. Matter is electrified by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, causing it to build atoms which then join to form molecules. The second outpouring, as you see it vertically on the diagram, the second outpouring comes down from the second aspect of the Trinity, God the Son. In the diagram, it is shown as descending from the middle circle. This outpouring draws the electrified matter around itself and forms it into bodies that it can inhabit. The lowest level to which the energy falls is the mineral kingdom, represented in the diagram by the very bottom of the curve. The energy next turns upwards to ensoul the vegetable kingdom and then the animal kingdom. When this spiritual energy has risen to the highest level of the animal kingdom, a major event takes place. That event is the joining of the third descent of energy called the third outpouring to the rising spiritual energy of the second outpouring. The third outpouring has descended from the third aspect of the Trinity, God the Father. This is shown in the diagram by the line from the circle at the top of the page ending at the small circle with the triangle in it on the right-hand side of the page. The small circle represents the juncture of the new third outpouring with the earlier second outpouring. The spiritual energy from the Father came forth from him long ago. It has been hovering like a mighty cloud, waiting for the previously released energy to rise as far as it was able. Hovering at that level, it is called the monad. The monad. 
The monad is therefore the pure white light of the third outpouring that has flashed straight down from its source and has not passed through any other form of matter. The major event that takes place is the formation of a new causal body when the monad joins a striving animal soul that has broken away from the group soul. The significance of this event is that it is now possible for the being with the new causal body to return to God. In the diagram, the small circle with the triangle inside it represents the new causal body, and the triangle inside the circle represents the ego. You can keep your page on that chart. In his book, Man Visible and Invisible, Ledbetter defines the ego. The word ego, as used in theosophical literature, does not correspond to the ego of modern psychology, but perhaps more accurately relates to the center of consciousness called the self. In theosophy, the ego is postulated as the true individual who periodically puts down portions of himself into personalities through successive incarnations. For all practical purposes, the ego may be termed the soul. It is regarded as that higher aspect of mind which is inseparately linked with the higher intuition and irradiated by the spirit. The causal body is, so to speak, the home of the ego. It serves as a vehicle of abstract thought and as a storehouse for the essence of all experience gained through the various incarnations. This should not be thought of in terms of space, of course, but rather as a complex of vibratory possibilities which will influence future actions and experience. It is termed causal because it is the realm of causes. When this causal body is newly formed, it is transparent yet iridescent, like a gigantic soap bubble when viewed by the higher clairvoyant sight. It resembles the soap bubble in being almost empty in its appearance, for the divine force, which is really contained within it, has had no time to develop its latent qualities, and consequently there is little color. But though a man now possesses a causal body, he is very far from being sufficiently conscious to receive impressions at that level. Therefore, the method of progress designed for him is reincarnation. Slowly, through many incarnations, man develops within himself many qualities, and all good development is steadily stored up within the causal body. Ledbetter discusses a problem that arises when one attempts to make a diagram of the theosophical teachings. He points out that when one speaks of the movement of energy from finer matter into denser matter, it is customary to use the term descent. And these planes of matter are portrayed in the diagram as though they lay one above the other like the shelves of a bookcase. Nevertheless, he says, in reality, the matter of all these planes lies in the same space. So that when we speak of the divine life as descending into matter, it must be clearly understood that no motion in space is implied, but simply the vivification of degrees of matter. Finally, Ledbetter draws a parallel between the action of the monad and that of the ego. As the monad puts down a part of itself into matter as the ego, so the ego puts down a part of itself into the personality. This last tiny fragment is the Atman of the Hindus. It is described in the Upanishads as the golden man, the size of a thumb, who dwells in the heart. Ledbetter concludes, I have always seen it as a brilliant star of light. A man may keep this star of consciousness where he will, in one of the seven principal centers of the body. This star of consciousness is the representative of the ego down here in these lower planes. And as it manifests through those vehicles, we call it personality. 
and that is the man as he is known to his friends down here. End of quote by Ledbetter. So this is something you can contemplate, meditate on, enter into, depending how much time you want to put into it. Now we're on chapter 8, the ego, entitled The Birth of the Ego. In order that the further steps on the path may be clearly understood, it is necessary at this point to consider the ego and the way in which he has awakened and put forth his powers to bring the personality into harmony with himself and to reach up to the buddhic plane and realize his unity with all that lives. In Man, Visible and Invisible, and the Christian Creed, I published a diagram which I reproduce here, illustrating the three outpourings of the divine life in our evolutionary scheme. Communication with a personality. But though that personality is absolutely part of the ego, though the only life and power in it are those of the ego, it nevertheless often forgets those facts and comes to regard itself as an entirely separate entity and works down here for its own ends. It has always a line of communication with the ego, often called in our books the Antakarana, but it generally makes no effort to use it. In the case of ordinary people who have never studied these matters, the personality is to all intents and purposes the man, and the ego manifests himself only very rarely and partially. Man's evolution in its earlier stages consists in the opening up of this line of communication so that the ego may be increasingly able to assert himself through it and finally entirely to dominate the personality so that it may have no separate thought or will but may be merely as it should be an expression of the ego on these lower planes. It must, of course, be understood that the ego, belonging as he does to an altogether higher plane, can never fully express himself down here. The most for which we can hope is that the personality will contain nothing which is not intended by the ego, that it will express as much of him as can be expressed in this lower world. The absolutely untrained man has practically no communication with the ego. The initiate has full communication. Consequently, we find, as we should expect, that there are men among us at all stages between these two extremes. It must be remembered that the ego himself is only in process of development, and that we have therefore to deal with egos in very different stages of advancement. In any case, an ego is, in a great many ways, something enormously bigger than a personality can ever be. Though, as has been said, he is but a fragment of the monad, he is yet complete as an ego in his causal body, even when his powers are undeveloped, whereas there is but a touch of his life in the personality. It is also true that life is, at his level is an infinitely larger and more vivid thing than what we know as life down here. Just as it is evolution for the personality to learn to express the ego more fully, so it is evolution for the ego to learn to express the monad more fully. An undeveloped personality forgets all about this connection with the ego and feels himself quite independent. It can hardly be possible for an ego at his much higher level to be unaware of his link with the monad. Certainly some egos are far more awake to the necessities of their evolution than others, which is only another way of saying that there are older and younger egos and that the older are striving more earnestly than the younger to unfold their latent possibilities. The next section is In His Own World. We are apt to think that the only development possible for an ego is through the personality, but that is not so or rather it is so only in connection with one small set of qualities. As I have explained at length in Man Visible and Invisible, the causal body of an undeveloped man is almost colorless. 
As in the process of his evolution, he develops good qualities which can find corresponding vibrations in the matter of the causal body, the colors expressive of these qualities begin to show themselves. And presently, the causal body, instead of being empty, is full of active, pulsating life. So much more of the ego can now manifest through it that it has to increase enormously in size. It extends further and further from its physical center until the man is able to enfold hundreds and even thousands of persons within himself and so to exercise a vast influence for good. But all this, wonderful though it be, is only one side of his development. He has quite other lines of progress of which we down here know nothing. He is living a life of his own among his peers, among the great Arupa Devas, among all kinds of splendid angels in a world far beyond our ken. The young ego probably is but little awake as yet to all the glorious life, just as a baby in arms knows little of the interests of the world surrounding him. But as his consciousness gradually unfolds, he awakens to all this magnificence, he becomes fascinated by its vividness and beauty. At the same time, he himself becomes a glorious object and gives us for the first time some idea of what God means man to be. Among such beings, thoughts no longer take form and float about as they do at lower levels, but pass like lightning flashes from one to another. Here we have no newly acquired vehicles, gradually coming under control and learning by degrees, more or less feebly to express the soul within. But we are face to face with one body, older than the hills, an actual expression of the divine glory, which ever rests behind it and shines through it more and more in the gradual unfolding of its powers. Here we deal no longer with outward forms, but we see the things in themselves, the reality which lies behind the imperfect expression. Here, cause and effect are one, clearly visible in their unity, like two sides of the same coin. Here we have left the concrete for the abstract. We have no longer the multiplicity of forms, but the idea which lies behind all those forms." Here, the essence of everything is available. We no longer study details. We no longer talk round a subject or endeavor to explain. We take up the essence or the idea of the subject and move it as a whole, as one moves a piece when playing chess. What down here would be a system of philosophy needing many volumes to explain it is there a single definite object, a thought which can be thrown down as one throws a card upon the table. An opera or an oratorio, which here would occupy a full orchestra for many hours is in the rendering, is there a single mighty chord. The methods of the whole school of painting are condensed into one magnificent idea, and ideas such as these are the intellectual counters which are used by egos in their converse one with another. It is not easy to explain in physical words the differences which exist between egos, since all of them are in many ways much greater than anything to which we are accustomed down here. An ego who is already on the path and is nearing adeptship has much in common with the great angels and radiates spiritual influences of prodigious power. His interest in the personality... Can we wonder, then, that the ego throws himself energetically into the whirl of intense activity of his own plane, and that it seems to him immensely more interesting and important than the faint, far-distant struggles of a cramped and half-formed personality veiled in the dense obscurity of a lower world? In the physical life of the ordinary man of the world, there is little of interest to the ego, and it is only now and then that something of real importance occurs that may for a moment attract his attention so that from it he draws nearer whatever is worth taking. The ordinary man lives in patches. More than half the time he is not awake to the real and higher life at all. Some of us are apt to complain that our egos take very little notice of us. Let us ask ourselves how much notice we have taken of them. How often, for example, in any given day have we even thought of the ego? 
If we wish to attract his attention, we must make the personality useful to him. As soon as we begin to devote the greater part of our thought to higher things, and that is equivalent to saying as soon as we really begin to live, the ego will be likely to take somewhat more notice of us. The ego knows that certain necessary parts of his evolution can be achieved only through the personality and in its mental, astral, and physical bodies. He knows, therefore, that he must sometime attend to it, must take it in hand and bring it under his control. But we can well understand that the task may often seem uninviting, that a given personality may appear anything but attractive or hopeful. If we look at many of the personalities around us, their physical bodies poisoned with meat, alcohol, and tobacco, their astral bodies reeking with greed and sensuality, and their mental bodies having no interests beyond business or perhaps horse racing and prize fighting, it is not difficult to see why an ego, surveying them from his lofty height, might decide to postpone his serious effort to another incarnation in the hope that the next set of vehicles might be more amenable to influence than those upon which his horrified gaze then rested. We can imagine that he might say to himself, I can do nothing with that. I will take my chance of getting something better next time. It can hardly be worse, and meantime I have much more important business to do up here. A similar thing not infrequently happens in the early stages of a new incarnation. From the birth of the child, the ego is hovering over it, and in some cases he begins to try to influence its development while it is still very young. As a general rule, he pays little attention to it until about the age of seven, by which time the work of the karmic elemental should be practically over. Children differ so widely that it is not surprising to find that the relation between the egos and the personalities involved differs widely also. Some child personalities are quick and responsive. Some are dull or wayward. When the latter characteristics are prominent, the ego often withdraws his active interest for the time, hoping that as the childish body grows, it may become cleverer or more responsive. Such a decision may seem to us unwise because if the ego neglects his present personality, it is unlikely that the next will be an improvement upon it. And if he allows the child body to develop without his influence, the undesirable qualities which have been manifested may quite possibly grow stronger instead of dying out. But we are hardly in a position to judge since our knowledge of the problem is so imperfect and we can see nothing of the higher business to which he is devoting himself. From this it will be seen how impossible it is to judge with any precision the position in evolution of anyone whom we see only on the physical plane. In one case, karmic causes may have produced a very fair personality, having an ego of only moderate advancement behind it, while in another case those causes may have given rise to an inferior or defective personality belonging to a comparatively advanced ego. A good illustration of this appears among the stories of the life of the Lord Buddha. A man came to him one day, as people in trouble were wont to do, and told him that he had great difficulty with his meditation, which he could scarcely succeed in doing at all. Then the Buddha told him that there was a very simple reason for it, that in a previous life he had foolishly been in the habit of annoying certain holy men and disturbing their meditations. Yet that man may have been more advanced as an ego than some of his companions whose meditations were well done. When the ego does decide to turn the full force of his energy upon the personality, the change which he can produce is marvelous. No one who has not personally investigated the matter can imagine how wonderful, how rapid, how radical such a change may be when conditions are favorable. That is when the ego is reasonably strong and the personality not incurably vicious, more especially when a determined effort is made by the personality on its side to become a perfect expression of the ego and make itself attractive to him. The Attitude of the Personality The difficulty of this subject is greatly enhanced by the fact that it is necessary for us to regard it simultaneously from two points of view. Most of us down here are very emphatically personalities and think and act almost exclusively as such, 
Yet we know all the time that in reality we are egos, and those of us who by many years of meditation have rendered ourselves more sensitive to finer influences are often conscious of the intervention of this higher self. The more we can make a habit of identifying ourselves with the ego, the more clearly and sanely shall we view the problems of life. But in so far as we feel ourselves to be still personalities looking up to our higher selves, it is obviously our duty and our interest to open ourselves to them, to reach up towards them, and persistently to set up within ourselves such vibrations as will be of use to them. At least let us be sure that we do not stand in the way of the ego, that we always do our best for him according to our lights. Since selfishness is the intensification of the personality, our first step should be to get rid of that. Then we must keep our minds filled with high thoughts, for if they are continually occupied with lower matters, even though these lower matters may be quite estimable in their way, the ego cannot readily use them as channels of expression. When he makes a tentative effort, when he puts down an exploratory finger, let us receive him with enthusiasm and hasten to obey his behests, that he may take possession of our minds more and more, and so come into his inheritance as far as these lower planes are concerned. Thus shall we set our feet upon the path which leads directly to that first initiation in which the lower and the higher become one, or rather the greater has absorbed the lesser, so that there should now be nothing in the personality which is not a representation of the ego. The lower is now merely an expression of the higher. The personality may have had a great many unpleasant qualities of his own, such as jealousy, anger, and depression, but they have all been cast off, and now he merely reproduces that which comes from above. The ego, having brought the lower self into harmony with himself, is now reaching upwards into the buddhic plane, the plane of unity. It is only in this way that the man can begin to cast off the delusion of self which stands in the way of his further progress, and that is why the buddhic experience is necessary at the first initiation, if it has not been had before. In many cases, it has come earlier because the higher emotions, showing themselves in the astral body, have reflected themselves in the buddhic vehicle and aroused it, and consequently there is some awakening before initiation. Realization of Unity All that lives is really one, and it is the duty of those who enter the brotherhood to know that as a fact. We are taught that the self is one, and we try to understand what that means. But it is quite a different thing when we see it for ourselves, as the candidate does when he enters the buddhic plane. It is as if, in physical life, we were each living at the bottom of a well, from which we may look up at the sunlight in the world above. And just as the light shines down into the depth of many wells, and yet ever remains the one light, so does the light of the one illumine the darkness of our hearts. The initiate has climbed out of the well of the personality and sees that the light which he thought to be himself is in very truth the infinite light of all. While living in the causal body, the ego already acknowledged the divine consciousness in all. When he looked upon another ego, his consciousness leapt up as it were, to recognize the divine in him. But on the buddhic plane, it no longer leaps to greet him from without, for it is already enshrined within his heart. He is that consciousness, and it is his. There is no longer the you and the I, for both are one, facets of something that transcends and yet includes them both. Yet in all this strange advance, there is no loss of the sense of individuality, even though there is an utter loss of the sense of separateness. That seems a paradox, while yet it is obviously true. The man remembers all that lies behind him. He is himself the same man who did this action or that in the far-off past. He is in no way changed except that now he is 
much more than he was then, and feels that he includes within himself many other manifestations as well. If here and now a hundred of us could simultaneously raise our consciousness into the intuitional world, we should all be one consciousness. But to each man that would seem to be his own, absolutely unchanged, except that now it included all the others as well. To each it would seem that it was he who had absorbed or included all those others. So we are here manifestly in the presence of a kind of illusion, and a little further realization makes it clear to us that we are all facets of a greater consciousness, and that what we have hitherto thought to be our qualities, our intellect, our energies, have all the time been his qualities, his intellect, his energy. We have arrived at the realization in actual fact of the time-honored formula, thou art that. It is one thing to talk about this down here and to grasp it, or to think that we grasp it intellectually, but it is quite another to enter into the marvelous world and know it with a certainty that can never again be shaken. When this buddhic consciousness fully impresses the physical brain, it gives a new value to all the actions and relations of life. We no longer look upon a person or object, no matter with what degree of kindliness or sympathy. We simply are that person or object, and we know him or it as we know the thought of our own brain or the movement of our own hand. We appreciate his motives as our own motives, even though we may perfectly understand that another part of ourselves possessing more knowledge or a different viewpoint might act quite differently. Yet it must not be supposed that when a man enters upon the lowest subdivision of the intuitional world, he at once becomes fully conscious of his unity with all that lives. That perfection of sense comes only as the result of much toil and trouble when he has reached the highest subdivision of this realm of unity. To enter that plane at all is to experience an enormous extension of consciousness, to realize himself as one with many others. But before him there opens a time of effort, of self-development analogous at that level to what we do down here when by meditation we try to open our consciousness to the plane next above us. Step by step, sub-plane by sub-plane, the aspirant must win his way. For even at that level, exertion is still necessary if progress is to be made. Exertion is still necessary. I would suggest you circle those four words and put them on your wall, because some of us think that we have it made and we don't have to exert an effort at all. But we do. Having passed the first initiation and consciously entered the buddhic plane, this work of developing himself on subplane after subplane now lies before the candidate in order that he may get rid of the three great fetters, as they are technically called, which embarrass his further progress. He is now definitely on the path of holiness and is described in the Buddhist system as the Sotapati or Sovan, he who has entered the stream. While among the Hindus, he is called the Paravrajaka, which means the wanderer, one who no longer feels that any place in the three lower worlds is his abiding place of refuge. So he is definitely on the path of holiness. He is one who has entered the stream, and he is called the wanderer one who no longer feels that any place in the three lower worlds is his abiding place of refuge. I want to talk to you about a subject that concerns me greatly, and I think this is a good opportunity to get into it. You're welcome to take notes, and we won't be looking at the theosophy books for this. The subject is on the topic of taking offense. 
We are offended when a fellow chila, even in the most loving and delicate way, attempts to correct us in a situation where if we would be listening, we would take the advice, we would take the suggestion. But because it is a chila who is speaking to us and not the messenger, or not El Moria, or Kathumi, or an ascended master, then often we find that people go from a uh, mild dislike to uh, a tremendous amount of anger with the sense, how dare you correct me? How dare you uh, tell me that something I'm doing isn't right? So what happens is, when people don't take correction from the Christ in one another, then they are also not eligible to be corrected by the Guru or the Ascended Masters. So if you reject the messenger, if the messenger is an ant, El Moria says, heed him. If we don't listen to the messenger, thank the messenger, even if we can't stand the messenger and we don't believe anything that he has said to us is correct about ourselves because we have our own human opinions about what wonderful people we are. And so I have seen the ramifications of this to be the following, that when you refuse the messenger that God has sent you, if the messenger be an ant, heed him, and you turn away that messenger, then you lose the opportunity to be received or to receive the next messenger, who may be lower than an ant, because if you keep rejecting messengers, you finally are, start at the top and you go down and down and down and down until pretty soon uh, you are not heeding what El Moria is saying to you because you are indignant that someone who is so lowly and untutored and perhaps doesn't even speak English correctly, uh, may not be clean in body, may have all kinds of things around them that are an affront to you. Well, if, if all of that uh, burdens you and you can't receive from the beggar at the gate uh, a correction, then no angel will come again to give you the opportunity to be corrected because you have denounced your fellow chila or someone you've met along the way. Maybe you, maybe you meet someone on a train or a plane, and they just make a remark that is kind of a put-down. And you get all uh, you know, huffy and puffy about this thing that some, somebody spoke to you and put you down. Well, every time this happens, you make karma. You lose what you have gained in tremendous service, good service. And you set yourself back on the path. You could be facing El Moria right now and not recognize him because he would come to you in the guise of a beggar. And this beggar is begging for food or for money or a few coins or whatever. And you refuse to give that beggar any time. But you turn around and you embrace the beggar and then you realize you have embraced El Moria, who has come to you in disguise. So if you, if you look at your fellow chilas in this room and in all the patches who are attending, you realize that there is probably any number of people who are sitting with you this evening that you could learn a lot from, in whose presence you might learn humility, in whose presence you may come to know your pride, in whose presence you may come to know your anger because someone has spoken down to you and your pride simply does not allow you to process it. So I have wondered over the years what would be the opportune venue for me to take up this subject, and for me, it is our darshan. I have heard people say to me recently, that someone has blown up at them or at least gotten very overheated and indignant that um, they were challenged. And I can remember incidents like that that I have seen. I can remember in my own self over the years that I have found that I had to 
bring in the reins of my own pride to see to it that I was not rejecting someone that God has sent to me. No one uh, is exempt from this. We, we have all seen this happen in our lives. But the fact that we are Chila Zelvel Moria and we will listen to him or the messenger, but we will not listen to each other, is a very serious matter of pride. And I'm asking all of us to get rid of it, to recognize it when we see it, to know that that pride comes sneaking up through our dweller on the threshold, through our sense of how important we are, and all of a sudden, without warning, this, this part of our dweller leaps out of us, leaps out of our mouth, and attacks the very angel that has come to lead that one back to the straight and the homeward path. If you have had any circumstances recently or at any time in your life that bring back this particular subject, I would like you to come to the lectern if you would like to tell your story about an experience of human pride. This is an opportunity for you to balance karma where you have rejected a fellow chila or someone in the community or a stranger at the gate where you have neglected to turn off your pride and receive that messenger. I'd like us to ponder this because of the following. Many of you have been on the path for many years, many of you for many embodiments. When you are new on the path, even if you might not be a teenager or a child, but on in years, when you are new on the path, you are like a newborn babe. The masters treat you gently and carefully. They've overlooked some things that they're not going to overlook five years later or 10 years later, because by that time, you should know better. So if you let pride as a snake kind of curl in and out of your life like this, and you don't do something about it, then your karma will be heavier because you know the law. And when we know the law, then we don't have an excuse. I think pride is a very intense enemy. And I think it lurks in places. And if we are off guard, that pride takes us over. So some of you have been counting the years that you have served here in preparation for your leaving and you're taking the package. Some of you have served for many, many, many years. You are the ones who are most vulnerable. You are the ones who must recognize that pride will follow you out the door. So will anger. So will your criticism of the way this happened or that happened or the next thing happened. Pride can be your downfall in this life, even if you are seen as a saint by your friends, by your family members. You can lose your ascension by not slaying pride. Pride, as we know, is embodied in Lucifer, in Satan, and in the fallen angels. So if we allow ourselves to be proud, we are also going to be allowing in these fallen angels into our very bodies. And then by and by, it is not only pride, but is, it is anger that explodes through us. Now it takes courage to stand up and talk about pride and how we have allowed pride to cause us to fall. But I think we need to discuss it because none of us is exempt from this. And I should like to hope that wherever we are, whether we're here at the ranch or we're somewhere in the world, that everyone will remember that there's one thing you cannot allow in your life, and that is pride, which leads you to your fall and to your undoing. Hi, Mother. Hi, everybody. Um, I had gone to the other room to watch the video and because I was being uncomfortable in the court, and uh, then you were saying this thing about if the messenger be an ant, uh, and if we ha we've had anything that had happened to us recently about pride, I said, wow, she's talking to me. So I ran back to um, 
come and share this. It just happened just uh, at supper time uh, with my husband. And he, we were talking about decreeing and how much time we spend decreeing and going to services. And my husband is um, quite diligent about trying to attend as much as he can all the decree sessions and services. And I tend to be more lax or I have a, more of a difficulty doing as many as I would like. And so he was trying to tell me that he believes that I should try to do more. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to listen to him. I, I, I got offended and I, I, I said that I didn't uh, f feel comfortab comfortable he, him telling me that and judging me, uh, that I felt that my, uh, I, had, I, I saw the path as um, having, um, ha having a part of work where you give your, your service in work. And, um, but it has to be balanced with the decrees. So I didn't want to hear him tell me that I needed to do more decrees, but I, I, I regret that now, that I should have listened, because if I don't listen to this messenger, how will I get closer to the higher messengers? Um, so I would like to hear from you if you have any comments um, well, for me. Well, is not something that will go away. You have to beat it into submission. Pride is there, and it's, it's part of the consciousness of the Luciferians. They have even greater pride than Satan, if, if you can even measure the two. But pride is core evil. There's nothing good about pride. Nothing. You stop and think about it, except you might be exulting in it because someone told you you did something wonderful, and then you start feeling proud. So pride is an enemy, and you will not lick the enemy by doing more service um, in your department, thinking, well, if I serve so many extra hours, that'll make up for being in the court or at any altar of God. It will not make it up because pride doesn't go without a big fight, a big fight. And it's right there, almost like if you would see a snake right at the, right at the forehead of a snake ready to attack uh, when we are off guard. So this is why, why we go to church. This is why we come to the altar, to renew our strength, renew our resolve, to commune together and support one another when we see we've had a frailty. But um, you will not beat pride by rationalizing that if I go and do this work and work all night, that somehow um, I will overcome my pride. No, you will only overcome your pride by wrestling with it and really wrestling hard. And then doing what Gautama Buddha does is to self-observe. As you go through your day, you observe, what is my heart doing? What is my head doing? Um, am I at peace? Do I have anger? Do I have pride? Has someone annoyed me five minutes ago and irked me? It's like this pride that goeth before the fall, this is, is probably Lucifer's greatest weapon against the saints. So never underestimate this, this spirit of pride who can come to you in the night, in the day, anytime, anywhere, and uh, especially point out to this and that and the next person um, how terrible they are and then you know, you go along with the Luciferian mentality. So I think if I, was, if I were going to put pride somewhere on the chakras, I would put it on the crown chakra because there sits the coiled serpent on the crown in place of uh, the living Godhead who is over us, and we have to displace him. So I think it's serious, and I think without realizing it because evil is so um, conniving that we have made karma when we haven't realized that we've made karma 
just because we have hung on to some aspect of pride, how dare th that someone said thus and such to me, how dare they talk to me that way, and so forth. All of that we have to conquer, and we need to do it fast. We, we need to be right there with our, <laughs> with our weapons and, and ready for that spirit every time it comes. So don't let that spirit put you down and make you feel like you're an awful person. That's the next thing they do. So don't let that happen. Drive it right back into them, bind the dweller, and move on. Learn a lesson. Don't repeat it. Don't have to take that lesson 60 times, you know. Learn it once, learn it well, be on guard. We'll win. We'll have our victory. Why don't you invite a friend or a stranger in the community to honestly express to you um, what, what they may think of your situation or your pride. It might be very enlightening to hear that from someone. We should be able to take it. Thank you. The antidote for pride is humility. Do something that is humbling to you. You know, scrub the kitchen floor without being told. Clean the bathrooms when nobody notices you. Uh, you know, do something special for a friend, but don't tell them that you've done it, because whatever that special thing is, uh, they'll receive it one way or the other. Don't make known um, the blessings you give to people, because if you have to tell someone or a group of people what a wonderful thing you did for these starving children over here, you ca you've kind of missed the point of the glorious um, gift that you receive from being an anonymous giver. Mm -hmm. It's like the statue on the altar. It's an anonymous giver. So now our attention is upon the statue and not constantly on the giver of the statue. So let's do some humble things. Let's do some humble things that we have thought were beneath us. This very morning, <laughs> I work in shipping and I pick thousands of orders off the shelves every day. And I said to myself, when I make all these, I don't make a lot of mistakes, but say out of a thousand picked items in a day, I might have two or three errors. And the packers have to come and say to me, uh, you know, the, you made a mistake here. <laughs> and I find it very difficult um, to fail. I, I just find it very difficult, and I, I've worked in shipping now for four years, and I am very defensive, and I didn't realize I was defensive, except, as I said this morning, I said, my goodness, every time they call me on something, I have to um, defend myself. I have to say, oh, because of this, or because of this, or because of that, I did, you know, I made this mistake. It's, I can't, you know, just back off and just say thank you for, you know, catching that before um, it went through. And so, um, when we first, I was picking a Chile ship pin today, and I said, when, I, when that Chile ship pin first came out, I used to tell everybody, oh, I'll never meet mother to get a correction, but boy, I'll meet someone every day that's going to correct me. And that Sheila ship pen to me always meant that I was going to get a correction from some Sheila or somebody uh, that would be speaking for you or the masters. That's very good. That's very good. I can be in many places at once, but <laughs> only at one place where you can see me. Because the rest of the time I'm out of the body somewhere. <laughs> so you probably are not going to have to exercise that chila ship pin very often because you're not going to see me very often. Right. So you have already gotten the idea that right. that chila ship pin is for you to invite chilas right. to, to help you self perfect. Yes, and I've, um, like I said, I've gotten some real criticism <laughs> from that pin. And every day I wear it proudly, you know, knowing that Elmore or somebody's going to speak to me through another. But um, 
I, as I say, I've been having a lot of difficulty lately, and I, I, it's not so much a difficulty as I consider it a grace that all of a sudden I'm very conscious of always uh, defending myself when I fail. And um, did you did you have to do that to please your father or your mother? Yes, and uh, that's another thing I was going to mention is that it's definitely inner child work because when this individual or other individual, and there's four or five men that I work with, <laughs> and uh, this one time a couple of days ago I said, oh my goodness, that was my father. I mean, I was just so obvious that it was my father speaking to me that I said, boy, I have a lot of work to do <laughs> on that. So, um, well, I... You're awake. You know, how many people here really think you're awake? We all should be awake, shouldn't we? But we're maybe not awake 100% of the time, awake to the fact that this is an initiation. So there's uh, a lot of work to do, <clears throat> and I know I have a lot of work to do on that pride, and I, and I know particularly that I have problems with the equality, where some people are too high, <laughs> like I, I still have problems with my relationship with you, that, you know, you're just too high for me to even <laughs> communicate with. And then others, it's like, I find myself often, you know, thinking, oh, I know more than you do, you know, or I, uh, I know how to do that better than you do. And I see that as pride. And uh, I've been very conscious of that lately, too. Well, sometimes it's helpfulness, you know, if you can help someone do something that they're awkward at doing. So, um, who is it? I think it's um, Amitabha, <laughs> the Buddha that um, I've asked to help me with this situation. Call for his electronic Any presence quality. over you every day, his chakras over your chakras every day. And this will accelerate, accelerate more swiftly. Yes. So I want to apologize to all the fellows in <laughs> shipping <laughs> for uh, <laughs> giving them a hard time instead of uh, gracefully accepting uh, their corrections. Well, as you are gracious, they will look into the mirror of your soul and your soul will reflect back to them your graciousness. And so they will be gracious to you. Thank you. Dearest Mother, beloved uh, friends and seekers on the path, she sort of had one barrel, I got two barrels to deal with both father and mother. Now, I'm telling you this not because it's a big horrible story or anything, it could be considered to be that, but it's just, it's just sort of the way I got it figured out so far. And I would really appreciate anybody who has any insights or, or wants to tell me anything that I do that uh, is not leading me toward the Christ that I would really appreciate you telling me. And I, I don't know exactly how I'll react to it, but you know, within I will never, I will never hold it against you, and I will definitely um, even compliment you on the, maybe the next hour, or the next day. I guarantee it. That's going to be a fact. But here's what happened: um, when I was growing up, before age four, my father and my mother divorced, and when my mother took me home. To her grandparents, she left me there and went out and worked. So I got left by both my parents. And a lot of things happened in the zero to four years, which basically caused me, my weak soul to make, or my weak personality, or whatever you want to call it, to make a couple of decisions. One, the decision when my father was dangerous. And I had to protect myself from him. Step two was that my mother was unreliable. She never protected me from my father, and then she left, so she's unreliable. So therefore, I have both Alpha and Omega locked up in boxes, not being unreliable or people that I can be open to without uh, suffering setbacks. In fact, a footnote here is that the only safe place for me in the house was in bed. Sleeping, remember? Some of you? <laughs> still on the sleeping thing. See, it still comes up. So... Um, when, I, when I finally began to dope this out here in the community a little bit, um, 
One time I had to call Michael McNeil up and tell him that um, I had to apologize for being so hard to get along with because I realized that he, he was an authority figure and therefore fell into the box with my father. And um, with women, you know, it's also, it's a difficult thing to get too near them because, you know, when you give your love to them and they go away, uh, it, it hurts. As, as it did when my mother left me when I was young. So therefore, I have, I'm a 360-degree prickly pear here, both men and women, authority figures and new situations and all these bring a lot of fear up for me. What are you going to do about it? Well, uh, just the awareness of it is making it go away. Well, I mean, I'm making a lot go, of progress in getting it, it to go, go away. away. Pardon? It won't make it all go away. Well, I, I don't know. I'm making calls all the time on this material. I realize that, but there's the processing. You know, you think you've, you think you've beaten it, you think you've licked it, you come around full circle, there it is standing, at you, standing before you. No, it's still, you it still the is there. It's still coming back. I mean, it, it, it's grad, it gradually goes away when we're sincerely working on our psychology. But you just don't level it in one night. Well, but you, you make some suggestions. I'll be glad to follow them. Well, think more of yourself immaculately and don't give any power over the circumstances of your life because these were the karmic conditions into which you came because of your karma. These parents had to come together to have you. They weren't able to stay together. So you were in the predicament of being cared for here, there. But if you keep thinking about that, you almost reinforce its reality instead of going back to that point in time when you knew that you were the Christ and you were descending into incarnation and that you would meet your karma, you would meet your challenges, you would meet this community, you would meet the ascended masters. And if you're on that positive wavelength of victory, you will make your ascension. So the point here is don't don't be so focused on the past because we bargain for that. Every single one of us here in this room, if we had problems with parents, father, mother, siblings, that's our karma. And we, we went before the Lords of Karma and we said, we want to take this karma now because we want to move on. We want to ascend. So this place is the springboard to your victory. And keep your eye on the goal of victory rather than retelling the story and revolving the story. These things, according to the amount of years you've been on the path, should have greatly reduced in their intensity. I don't know how intense you feel about those issues now, but you sound like you're talking about them in the present tense. Yet you've had all these years, half a century, 40, 45, whatever your age is, You've had time to put this behind you and you've known about the violet flame long enough. So the Ascended Masters are going to get impatient with you because you need to move on into higher levels and, and put this stuff behind you. It has no power. You're, you're giving it power and feeding it power. And you're walking around and saying, I'm the kid that, you know, my parents were divorced. This is what happened to me. And, you know, it, it keeps on, you keep on recreating it after you've, after you've transmuted it with a violet flame. Well, I didn't even realize this a month ago. Well, a month so is too long. So <laughs> therefore, <laughs> well, that's fine. You've been revolving it a month. That's enough. Carry on. Get on with with uh, your. Well, that's victory. why I say it's not. It's just a little il illustration. It's not a big thing. Well, we thank you for the illustration. Thank you, Mother. Hello, Mother, friends. I'd like to share uh, an insight that I've had about uh, pride. I'd like to first tell two different stories, two things that have happened. To me, I've learned the same lesson twice, uh, and it's well worth learning, so I just want to sharing it. I was working in 1975 as a security guard at a coal mine, and uh, there were several guys there who were uh, quite very uh, serious about our jobs, and we were very fun loving also. And one of the guys decided to go into town once, 
and uh, by a car. And uh, he went alone. And he was, there were two brothers. And uh, so one of the brothers goes into town, he buys this car, and he comes back with this amazing bomb. I mean, it was really a ramshackle car. And we just wrote him about it. I mean, we, really, we were making fun of, it, of the car. He was a very loving person. We all loved him. He was, he was, he was like a... I forget, the, I forget the name of the actor, but it's a very... Yeah, Costello, I think. Uh, I forget his first name. Very much like that guy. But anyway, he was very much loved. He comes back with this car, and we were, just, we were seriously making fun of it because it really was an awful car. And, then, and he really, after about an hour of this, <laughs> he took very serious offense to it. And he thought that we were making fun of him and that he was a bad person because he had bought this car. He was very much identifying with this car. And I, what I learned was that when we were putting down this car, we were really putting down him. His judgment. His, his judgment and whatever about it. His body. I mean, everything about him, he really felt bad, and I felt extremely bad afterwards. We were having a good time, and we, really didn't, we loved him. We, didn't, we weren't putting him down, we thought. Okay, that's story one. Second story is I used to work at LRY, and I had about 150 violets in my uh, office. That's right, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved them very much. They were blooming all the time. And uh, there was a person that used to work there who uh, I didn't get along with very well. And he came into my office one day. We, we, we didn't really, we were like this, you know, we, we just didn't really connect. And he starts talking about how my violets were like a jungle and, and why, are, why, why does he have all these, do I have all these grungy plants around? And he, and he took one of the leaves and broke it off. You know, like to me, he was taking my arm and breaking it off, you know. <laughs> and um, I was a very calm person at that time and I, I kind of became less than calm at that point. <laughs> and uh, told him to get out of my office and never come back. I mean, a little even more vociferous than that. And uh, that really surprised me because, I mean, it's just like a volcano coming up, you know. It's just that, that was inside of me. And uh, so this time the shoe was on the other foot. I was identifying with the violets, and he was, he, the same thing happened exactly. And I remembered what had happened in 75. I said, well, this is interesting. That can happen to me too. So the, the point is, <clears throat> the lesson that I'm, I've learned is, the more centered that you are with your Holy Christ self and the less you identify with outer things, the less you're going to put yourself in the way of this serpent of pride and, and, and be uh, uh, liable to be stepped on and then have things which you don't know about coming up and going out instead of into the violet flame. So that's, that's the main thing that I was wanting to convey to you is that... <clears throat> It really pays to uh, walk the buddhic path, to be, be centered in, in your heart as much as you can. And I mean, unconsciously, we, we live in the outer world and we're constantly seeing things and we identify with them and we think that we own a lot of things, which we of course don't own anything. And the more that you think that, the more you're going to be laying yourself wide open to be stepped on and taken advantage of. Al Maurice says there's only one thing you do with a rattlesnake. You kill him. And just see the rattlesnake as your pride. I just want to share that. There's only one thing to do with that pride. Kill it. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, friends. I wanted to share with the community um, a few lessons on pride that I've had over the years. Some of these instances uh, I've been dealing with for long periods of time and feel like... Uh, I had the victory over them. Uh, one of the first encounters of, with pride that I've had in, after joining staff was the pride of culture and of upbringing. Uh, I grew up in a household where we had maid servants and we didn't have to cook our own food. So uh, one of my tests, one of my first tests on staff was to, and I knew it was, was to overcome that sense of pride that I was the boss and everybody else was a servant. So I learned the, how to become a servant. and. Uh, and the way I learned to pass this test was to enjoy cleaning, cooking, making carrot juice, waking up early, washing dishes, which, um, which was very healing for my own soul. And I knew that 
it was like removing the old um, weavings my soul had had when, as I was growing up initially and having to reweave those strands and learning the concept of service. Um, the second encounter of pride, I, uh, one of the tests was that the pride of position, um, having a fairly good education and good standing in school, thinking that I knew more than other people would about aspects of design, construction. Um, there was this sense of pride that would not take um, answers from anybody else who had not that education. And it was a pride of profession, a pride of position that uh, I had to overcome through work, through conscious effort to listen to people so that I could embody what they were trying to convey and really incorporate that into my own work to learn from them in essence. So that, that was a, a good lesson for me, which I, I continue to learn, to learn it. Then there's a sense of pride that I have encountered where, uh, pride of, and I've seen this not only in myself, but in other people also where they, um, it was the superiority inferiority complex where you think so and so is, is such and such on staff, they have this position on staff, and I'm at this position, placing oneself in a higher or lower position instead of seeing that person as the Christ and yourself as the Christ, striving in the same, in the same vein that they have their own tests, you have your own tests, one is not higher than the other, but we are all Christ the one striving to attain that union with Christ to outpicture the threefold flame of love, wisdom, and power. And uh, I really had to work on that and remind myself a lot that it's not higher or lower, it's that we are all striving to attain that goal. Another um, lesson that I've had is that uh, there's a pride that refuses to take the correction when it's given. Like, mother would give correction to me over the years, and uh, intellectually I'd say, well, this is the guru, this is what she says. Okay, I accept that, but in my heart, I would struggle with that. And uh, when I'd finally get to the point of acceptance, I, then uh, I would find myself worthy to receive another correction. And then I know that it was an ongoing process that uh, the slaying of this pride, which uh, the presence of the guru accelerates, which, uh, for which I'm truly grateful. And then uh, there's a pride of, uh, not wanting to be supervised, or not wanting to accept the word of the guru as it comes through a supervisor. Like I've worked with a supervisor for many years, and if, if I'd be in a disagreement with my supervisor, I tend to say, well, it's a professional disagreement. But if, if, one, if I looked at it in a different respect and said that El Moria is trying to tell me something through my supervisor, and I just have to be humble about this, then I'll be able to get through it. And, um, God knows I encountered this for many years, and when I finally came around to accepting it over the years, I'd accepted and accepted, uh, almost browbeating myself to the point of acceptance. When I finally accepted it with real love, then that test finally started to disappear <laughs> because I was able to see the Christ or the flame of the guru that was coming through this individual. And it wasn't just my supervisor, it could have been um, somebody who was my coworker. Now, my current test, which is the hardest one, is uh, the, the, hard, the pride, the hardness of heart that is born out of pride, which refuses to grant forgiveness for, for wrongs committed. It's, it's, uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. People who are criticizing you, are you criticizing? No, for um, that, it's, uh, it's a hardness of heart that I have and it's born out of pride because people have offended me or it's been a very grave, long-term, long-standing offense, records, past lives, and it, that I have to struggle to really um, work on forgiveness. Uh, it's very difficult, and that's, that's my... You know, I've, I've told test. this before, but if you just let me interject a couple of sentences here. I think you've, you may remember I'll refresh your memory that I, I was um, living in the little trailer uh, next to my office, branch headquarters. And I woke up one morning 
and I heard my Holy Christ self forgiving my worst enemy. And my Holy Christ self was doing this by way of demonstrating. Mm -hmm. This is how you forgive your enemy. Now go and do likewise and forgive your enemies. It was the mo one of the most glorious experiences I've ever had in all lifetimes to realize that through our Holy Christ self we can forgive and that God deals with the divine justice and he meets out that justice so we don't have to hold in the anger, we don't have to hold in the pride because we think justice has not been done because it is done instantaneously when you go to your Holy Christ self. It occurred to me to ask you as you were telling me that, telling us that, that uh, is there a pride that refuses, that thinks that it is the self that grants forgiveness instead of, instead of accepting that it's really God's forgiveness that is being granted and not, not us who is giving the forgiveness? Until I understood the difference between um, the, the justice and the forgiveness elements, it was hard for me to let go of people who had attempted to destroy me, destroy the organization, you know, arch enemies of evil and darkness. Somehow, I think I had rationalized in myself that since they're so evil and they're so dark and they're not of the light, maybe they're not worthy of being forgiven. But the exercise of forgiving is so that we grow. It's, it's really not to their benefit. We benefit them because we do get, when we do forgive someone, we instantly cut the tie to an enemy that, that has been our enemy. And as long as we don't forgive our enemy, uh, we're, we're tied to that person, and that person could be an albatross around your neck for, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. So forgiving the enemy is a glorious experience, but what makes it palatable is that on the other side of the coin, God has said uh, that I will repay. I will repay. So God then deals with the justice side of things, and that's not our business. Our business is to forgive and the reason Jesus said it 70 times 7 is because he wanted to be sure that thoroughly and throughout our beings and our chakras, we have forgiven our enemies absolutely thoroughly and, and truly made amends with them, or else we would be tied to them. And if we're tied to them, they may have so much baggage that we, we can't get off the ground, we can't make our ascension. So an, an enemy is like a hot potato. <laughs> you deal with him immediately. You just absolutely deal with it right now. You can't even hold on to it. It's so hot. This is, you know, this is an enemy, and you must forgive that person with all the sincerity of your heart. Bless them and send them on their way. So if anybody is holding back forgiving, you could be having a major problem right now. Of, of somebody you absolutely have, have not been able to forgive, though we've mentioned it many, many times over the years. But it, it was such a sweet thing that my Holy Christ Self entered with the Holy Spirit because they cared about me being disconnected from this person, and they walked me through like I was a little child. See, this is how you forgive. This is how you do it. And I said, oh, this is how you do it. <laughs> That's a wonderful teaching, Mother. It's, it's like um, when, when there's one block, it blocks all the rest of the op open doors beyond it. And I feel like I have to go through this one door of forgiveness so that all the other doors can open. <laughs> well, just remember, as you were speaking, I, I wanted to say to you, there is no end to these prides. We, we repeat them. We forget that we decided we were not going to have pride and not going to do these things. And then all over again, all of a sudden it comes upon us. So while you were speaking, Almoria said, you will never be rid of pride until the day you pass on from this life. It will follow you. You have to slay it from every angle, from every level, 
from every situation. It will constantly knock at your door. It will fool you. It will come in many disguises. It will be here. It will be there. It will trick you. No, you can't. I, I want to be sure you, do, you don't think that you have resolved all your pride because you've made a tremendous thrust. But as soon as you're off guard, it'll be right there at, at the doorstep, at the dweller's level. Thank you, Mother. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we on the Portuguese teams, we are finishing the Jesus book. So we, we need to finish it in the next 10 days because one of, the, one of the ladies is going to Brazil and she is the best, one of the best revisors, translators. So we are kind of in a stressful uh, schedule over there in our trailer. And, uh, and it, what I noticed with myself is that small things, these, these small things that happen daily, like I don't, I don't express them, but like we are working and you know we need to do like three or four chapters each day, and then someone else come and try to improve the work or give some opinion, especially now we are changing the paradigm. So everyone needs to come and give new ideas. And it's amazing how inside of myself I feel that, oh boy, this person is coming here <laughs> telling me these things. I don't say anything, but it's really inside of myself. But what I really feel is uh, that I don't want to listen to people. And uh, there is a, an attempt to control, to even to impose my opinion. Of course, I don't say anything. Maybe some of them are listening to me. <laughs> they will not believe what I'm saying. But I think it's a, we are talking about something that is common for everyone. And uh, I remember when, like four or five years ago, when uh, I was in Brazil and we received the instruction that we should study psychology. And so my first book was uh, Understanding Yourself. And I don't know if it was Lanto, Kutumi, or Meru, one of them. I think it was Kutumi. He said, the level of pride is measured by our level of reaction. How we, re re we react is the level of our pride. So since that time, I start noticing in myself when I react to others, even if I don't say anything, my pride is there. And then another book that I remember is Toxic Parents, and, and, they, and they talk about a non non-defensive attitude, when someone come to you and say, you are doing this, you are doing that, uh, and you just list and you say, okay, so I understand what you are saying. You are saying that I am doing this, that I am doing that. You just repeat what the other person is saying, but you don't defend yourself. Uh, it helped me a lot using these techniques. And then the inner child work, when we one of the techniques is that we repeat what our child said to us. Like if our child come and say, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, you are working too much, we don't play. Instead of saying, you are bad, you are wrong, we repeat, we say, well, you are saying that you, you feel tired, that we are not playing. Is that that you are saying? And, and I found out that it's when I try to do this with myself, I'm able to do if it, this, this thing with others. Uh, but what I want to ask you, Mother, is that I found out that when I'm not doing my psychological work, uh, I always react more to others. If, I'm, like, if, I, if, I'm, if I didn't use the dialogue, the inner child dialogue that they then I feel that my reaction is, is greater. And then when I go to my room or to a walk and I start talking with myself, I find that uh, I, am reaction, I am reacting to others. My pride is there 
criticizing or judging or not accepting others because I'm not accepting myself and I, I'm not able to listen to my soul. And uh, so my question to you, Mother, is uh, how does the psychological work come in this situation of pride? And if you could please talk a little bit more about humility, because it's something we don't hear too much about, humility. I think we published in A Pearl of Wisdom in the last six months a page on humility, did we not? In any case, uh, pride is a planetary beast. And we tie into it through our child adult uh, that should be a child but is trying to be an adult and where we, we, we don't have that proper interaction. Um, one of the things that St. Germain did was to mitigate upon the founding of the United States, to mitigate the momentums of pride. I am absolutely convinced that St. Germain purged this nation of the serpents of pride. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there are, many, are not many proud people in this nation, but a lot of them are of the category where they do not have a threefold flame. They are magnates, they, they have tremendous power, tremendous wealth, and so forth. But rank and file people in the United States as compared to peoples I've met in Central and South America, in, in various countries around the world, uh, there is a much greater sense of pride. You could take France, for instance. I, I love France and I love the French people. But when you, when you think of de Gaulle or you think of uh, the various uh, recent presidents in France, Mitterrand, you know, he's extremely proud. I mean, I don't know what he'd ever do if he stepped on his toe, you know, it's just... And, and so you, you find this all over Europe, and it was very uh, apparent to me when I was 17, and I was uh, noticing the difference between Americans and, and other peoples. And not only did St. Germain sponsor us through the Declaration of Independence and all the basic understanding of, of our form of government, uh, but he also gave, through the Goddess of Liberty, that opening of the heart. So when you become an American citizen, uh, you receive that threefold flame of liberty. So these are, these are amazing things that um, St. Germain decided that it was this nation, this people, and the people he was going to bring to this nation, that he was going to purge them of that level of pride. I have noticed this when I go to Canada. I've noticed how the black magicians have moved in, moved in in Canada and have injected pride in the people so that if you happen to meet the wrong person and you say the wrong thing, their pride comes out. So in other words, it may not be your psychology. It may have something to do with your parents, but not everything. What it has to do with is that the fallen angels came here five, 500,000 years ago and perhaps even earlier. And they are the ones who have the pride. They are the Luciferians, and they have tried to put a seed of that pride, almost like you would, uh, that, like the seed of life, in in us, our, our very core of that seed of that essence of that ability to procreate, that they have desired to inject in the people of the world that seed of pride, because wherever that seed of pride is sown. The person in whom it is sown is now a prisoner of that pride and will probably not overcome it unless they are very astute or devout or extremely determined to become humble. Humility is the antidote for pride. Pride cannot touch you when you are truly humble. If you've already been injected with pride because of, of the situation of, of all the nations of the world, you now have the tools to undo it. But as Morea said earlier, you will never get rid of pride until the day you leave, you, you leave embodiment. Because if you overcome pride, then they have nothing over you. The, the prince in this world cometh and hath nothing in me. I would look at the larger picture, therefore, and not see yourself as terrible because you have pride. None of us should do that. It's a conspiracy. 
I'm, I'm not one that's running around with conspiracies all the time, but this is definitely a conspiracy. Take your mother. Good evening, mother. Um, I've been on the path for 10 years now, and I've been on staff for just over a year. And when you brought up the topic tonight, I realized I, I really need to get up here and speak about um, this problem of pride. Um, you, sometimes you just don't realize how subtle it is. Uh, each day, um, I come in contact, you know, with a certain person, and we, at times we get on really well, and then at other times we're at, at real loggerheads. We, and there's been two occasions where we've actually really confronted each other in, in arguing and shouting at e e each other. Um, it's been going on for a long time, and it's been a real burden because I couldn't really understand what, what was going on, why I'd react to this person so much. And, and in analyzing it, I realize that obviously it is pride. I don't like being told what to do. Um, there's just something that happens, especially when, when I'm working on a task and you, 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 know, you get interrupted and someone says, please, will you go and do this now? I feel the, these little feathers on the back of my head get really ruffled. And, um, <laughs> I've been working on this. I've been making the calls and casting out my duelo, and I've written to Almoria to help me balance this karma with this person and also um, to work on this pride. And, and it's working. Um, we we seem to be getting on a little better now, and I've apologised to her, which was that broke the this momentum that I you know that's been building up. In this last year, I feel as if, as if I've actually made more karma than I have any time in my life. <laughs> it seems that way, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, this, I just wanted to share this, and I just feel as well that, you know, irritation is a vestige of pride, and I've battled with irritation all my life. Um, I remember in my childhood with my sister being really impatient with her. We've worked through that, and we, we're actually really close, you know, now. We're the best of friends, but it still hurts when I think of how I treated her, and even... At times, the way I speak to, to my mom, it's just little things that come up. Like she came to visit here. She came over during the summer, uh, and I hadn't seen her in two years. She's in South Africa. And just one day, we were driving along, and she would say, well, have you checked the radiator water? And I nearly blew up. I thought, why are you asking me this? And it's like, I just don't like being told these things when I, I know them. And... Um, I just, I felt I needed to get up here and just confess these things, Mother, because I know it's a great deterrent to the path, and I, I feel I have, you know, when you talk about the setback, each day when you're faced with these things, I mean, I'm managing to catch myself now each time I'm feeling irritated with a particular person. Or I think that we have to um, substitute and when I'm, when I'm listening to you, we have to learn the quality of being gracious. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone comes to us in a rude way or, you know, our pride is peaked, we have to take a deep breath and then respond in graciousness. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Maybe I should check the water mm -hmm. and, and, and see if, uh, you know, we need it. Because you're deferring to someone who is... If you're senior in age, your mother, and and so, you know, you, you even if you think you're irritable or want to be irritable, she really has a right to say that to you, and you have a right to be gracious. Everyone here has a right to be gracious, no matter who's throwing what at you. We can always return with graciousness, and and there's so much um, love in graciousness. There's so much tenderness 
There's so much of a sense of having a, the sensitivity uh, of other people mm-hmm. who need to feel loved because you are gracious toward them. So why don't why don't we put this on our notepads on the list and you know when somebody's coming uh, down the road or or into your office or somewhere, be prepared to respond to whatever they're saying with graciousness. If they ask your help or can you help me do this or you know or they're they're p- perhaps in a tizzy about something, if you can maintain that center and do it for an hour, three hours, six hours, twelve hours. Well, one, you know, you can go to bed at night and say, gee, this whole day I haven't gotten irritable with anybody. And I have instead done something positive where I'm making now good, po- good karma because graciousness is the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior. The graciousness is what gets us through. Okay. It's kind of fun to conquer yourself. Mm-hmm. So then you have to figure out ways to outsmart yourself and outsmart the pride, outsmart the ego. It's a great feeling when you go to bed with it, but the pride is waiting for you. It'll be there tomorrow. You have to slay it again. (laughs) Believe me, it's there. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact is that God in you is greater, and that's the victory. Okay. Thank you very much, Mother. Bite your tongue. Bite your lip until it bleeds. I'm serious. Rather than make karma, you bite your lip. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, friends. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank my wife for coming up and giving her testimony. <laughs> um, I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, do I need to get up? And I didn't think so. <laughs> you know, and I kind of got this little subtle nudge from my wife. And I asked her if she was kind of prompting me, and she wasn't, she says I, she wasn't really sure, but to me it was sure, because it was that point of irritation that I felt in that nudge that kind of kept growing. And as I sat there, things started to unfold. As to, definitely, I do need to get up. So, so first of all, the way my wife painted the picture was that I was the good guy and she was the bad guy. Well, I think I need to set the record straight. But, um, not to say that anybody's a good guy or a bad guy, but um, I want to comment on diligence and going to decrease, first of all. Uh, I don't know how diligent I am. Uh, I, I kind of don't think I'm very diligent. For one thing, the quality of my decrees don't seem to be up to, up to the level. But when it comes to being diligent, a lot of times I, I feel that uh, I think in going to decrees, the, um, the reason behind it can be a point of pride or, or you're driven by guilt or things like this. How, how do you actually find time to, to actually think about you're going to you have pride going to decrees or you have this going to decrees. I mean, aren't you more engrossed in the challenges of the world and getting there on time and putting your full heart and soul into it and let Moria take care of the pride and the rest? You know, that, that pride thing is, is your hand over your knee with El Moria face down, written on a sheet of paper. That's what you want to do until you, you don't have to do that anymore or, or the various things have changed. Different pride things have come along in the meantime. But... If we don't use that blessing of El Moria, then, then El Moria doesn't have the, the energy for the world situation. <clears throat> well, what I find myself doing is comparing myself to others. Like, I'll go to decrees, and then I'll look around and see who's there. You know, it's like measuring people up. When you're following the rules, it's almost a justification that you're doing the right thing because you're following the rules. But... Another aspect of it that I want to point out is that I do find myself comparing myself with others, and a lot of times when I interact with people, people think I'm a nice guy. But a lot of times this like facade comes from false humility, and it's like behind, Sounds underneath. Sounds like you're too analytical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife says that a lot. She says I think a lot. 
You have to get beyond yourself on the path or you really don't, won't make it. You have to lose yourself in service. Forget about your name and who you are and what you wore today or if somebody yelled at you or didn't, you know. You can sit here revolving about all kinds of things. Uh, we're too comfortable. We have too much time to do that. The world doesn't have that much time. We, we have to be up and doing and our pride has to be you know, put in a bonfire and we move on. I mean, what you're saying to me today, it should not take you more than the 48 hours of this vigil to put it to bed forever. This stuff about looking at people, wondering what they're saying, wonder if you're better than they are. That's, that's not good. It's not healthy. Very unhealthy. You just, just quit it. Just make up your mind. This is an addiction. I'm quitting it tonight. I'm not going to be worrying about who's doing what out there. I don't worry about what, who's doing what out there, except to make you could do it louder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get after that on Friday. We're going to work on the power of our fire. Do you know what I mean? You could spend the rest of your life doing this. It revolving thoughts, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very unhealthy. How do you make decrees really have quality and fire? I mean, I've thought about this, and a lot of times I find my mind just wandering off. That's, and, that's and the point. You, you see, that particular valve is open, so you're losing energy, because now your brain is thinking. Or now some other part of you is, is having some kind of a rea reaction. So if you're, you're, if you're bleeding light from every chakra, because you're thinking about this and thinking about that, and, and you're not really putting positive fire into the chakra, but you're more thinking about whatever you're doing, or you're thinking about this level or the next level, or this down or this one up here, and pretty soon you've fragmented yourself. And so where's your power? What happened to your power? It kind of got trickled through all of your chakras, but in no, in no one of those chakras do you really have the, the power to punch through and you know, reach the other side of the world where something's happening. That's why we have to lose ourselves in service. When we're looking inward, it's like we're eating ourselves. You know, it's like you just go into the in this way instead of going outward. And it's it's very unhealthy and it's very dangerous. And if you're sitting there in your mind twiddling about what what you're doing or not doing or what the guy's doing over here or that there, you're losing your strength, your masculine strength the power that God endowed you with to embody the Ascended Masters, to be an Ascended Master. And this is very serious. I'm glad you came to the lectern, and you have to think about it, and not let your thoughts be divided here, there, and everywhere until instead of one major thought, I am going to this service, I'm going to stay here so long, I'm going to stand up for St. Germain, I'm going to give my calls with all the fire of my heart, I'm not going to look to the right or the left. I'm not going to think about problems at home. I'm not going to think about anything else but delivering the goods to El Moria while I'm in this court. And you have to discipline your mind because your, you have indulged your mind until it is spoiled. You've got a spoiled child for a mind that sits there, you know, revolving this stuff. And where are you? Where is the totality of your wholeness of your being since the time you came out of the great central sun and came all these lifetimes on planet Earth. You have gotten into a rut of self-examination. How can one stop that, though? Willpower. Call upon the Lord and, you know, you have to call to God and say, I can't stand this. I don't want it anymore. I, I want to be stripped. Pummel me. Do something. I can't stand it. I've got the whole world that I should be praying for, and here I am tiddly biddling with wondering what, who's doing what next to me. Make your ascension. Don't come back next time. You make it this time. Promise me. Look at El Moria. Promise him. You're going to make your ascension in this life and stop tiddling around. <laughs> stand in front of him and shout to him now. Go right up there. You're not where you are. In front of him. Here you are. Now give, give your fiat to him and let everybody rejoice. Master Amoria, I promise you, 
I will make my ascension in this life. Bravo. <laughs> Great. Evening, Mother, uh, friends, community. I didn't think I had a whole lot of pride, or at least I didn't think I had, had a problem with it until I got married. And uh, <laughs> then I realized I had a whole iceberg underneath the <laughs> surface that was now on the surface. Um, and I think uh, I, I grew up with a father who completely dominated uh, his wife, my mother. And, and uh, my wife is nothing of the sort. And I had the example where uh, my father told my mother what to do, and my mother didn't uh, say anything in response or in defense of herself. And I expected to marry uh, a wife like that. Well, I didn't, I didn't get that at all, which I'm very grateful for. My wife is very fiery, uh, even though to most of you she seems very meek. She, to me, she's very outspoken and she's very, um, she says what she wants to say. And, and so what I find is that uh, my own pride gets offended by it. And, and um, I find that, uh, that I'm facing this of, of somebody, uh, 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 my wife, a woman who's speaking to me in a tone that, I'm, that I've never been used to hearing before. But, we didn't hear anything before. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, you just told us. That, that's right. <laughs> um, but uh, what I've, I, I'm glad to hear that pride is going to be something that we're going to battle for the rest of our life because I constantly am a witness to that and I, and I feel that. I mean, not every day, of course, but it's there all the time. And uh, the one thing I found that really helps, or the one thing I found that I'm that I'm avoiding when 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 something comes, uh, pride comes up and it wants to av avoid it, wants to get away. And uh, what I found is that if I sit and listen to what is being told me, it hurts my heart. And I realize what's happening at that mo uh, moment is my heart is opening up, and that opening is a painful thing. And so instead of feeling the pain, the Part, the, the human consciousness of the pride wants to run away. I don't know if that's correct, but that's what I feel. And uh, so that's a process I've been going through. The, 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 it's, tr it's true. The beast of pride does, does not want to be killed, slain. And I feel it in my heart. It's where the, the pain of opening, of accepting, of receiving, and... and I know that's a, a chakra, an area that I, I need definite expansion in. Well, you know, you can carry pride in your heart all your life. A lot of people think this, this uh, humble hearth kind of notion that um, the heart is filled with love and does not have a problem. But the heart does have a problem. Our hearts do have a problem. The physical heart has a problem. And one of the problems that uh, is exacerbated in the heart is when we take in a lot of red meat and a lot of young food, then we develop hardness of heart. And I observed hardness of heart growing in me um, in the 10 years before I got on the macrobiotic diet. And um, I realized that that was the problem. And that is one of the key and major reasons why we don't advocate that we eat a lot of red meat. Because we develop hardness of heart. And you find the people all over the world who eat the most meat are the ones that have the greatest hardness. It's amazing to observe that as you travel. So that hardness is literally hardened fat. The fat of selfishness is sitting in our hearts. And this beast of pride is, is feeding on it. And when I, when I stopped my old diet and I'm on the macrobiotic diet, I feel the, the tenderness of my heart and the love of my heart that I can give to people. And the awe that I have in my heart 
before your Holy Christ Self, before your hearts. And I realized, amazingly, that it came down to the physical level as to whether or not I could sufficiently give the love of my being to the whole world, to all of my staff, to all the light bearers of the cosmos. So I had to pull down that love in tremendous quantities to reach many quantities of people. And, and I came to realize that the greatest gift that I can give to people is all the love of my heart, because my heart really is a vessel for Jesus, because I've kicked out that pride. But it's lurking. It's there. You know, I face it, as everybody does. But the, uh, the greater portion of my being is humble because I decided to be humble, not because it just happened. I decided that I have to be humble before your Christ self, humble before your being, your personhood, whoever you are. I, I don't even judge you whether you're advanced or not advanced. But it's my service to love you. And hopefully in loving you, you will let go of those things that, that have made you hold on to pride such as diet for, for starts, but then temperament. We have to take a hold of our temperament and our temper. For myself, I don't eat red meat. I mean, I haven't had meat in many, many a decade or so. It's probably very good that you haven't. Yeah. I grew up that way, though. My dad always ate that. Um, one, one technique I found that really helps me, not that uh, a technique that helps me to overcome the irritation or whatever is, uh, is to uh, give the mantra that Jesus gave us is what is that to thee follow thou me and no matter what offense or whatever I may take offense to if I give that mantra whatever it, it dissolves it passes away it may pass away but did you go after the root the root core of pride when I worked in the garden at home we had a big garden I had to get out the roots of all these weeds and things that choke the flowers. Do you go to the root of pride, or do you just let it pass away on the surface? I think I need to go after the root more. I think we all do. It's at that deep subconscious and then un unconscious level. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mother, and hello, friends. I have an incident that I want to talk about, which is pretty old, but it definitely has to do with pride. In the kitchen, you often have to tell people what to do. And uh, this situation happened several years ago. This beloved one who was there helping us um, was doing her work in a certain way. She'd been told to a certain way. And I came up being in a hurry and was entirely rude to her and told her um, very directly to do some other way of whatever it was that she was doing. And I thought that I had been working on my pride and other things about myself. And by God's grace, this lady was sharp enough to write to you and write to my supervisor and say, listen, if you have people in your kitchen, this is a paraphrase because it's been a long time, that, that are in this frame of mind, that are in this vibration, uh, that it's, it's not a very good thing. And so it was really interesting. It was like a slap in the face to wake me up, to say, look, look at what you're doing. And so um, since that time, I've, I've tried to do that. But the thing that was good about it was that I knew that I had to face this lady. And what I did eventually is she came, as she did from time to time, to come and help us. And I apologized to her, and I thanked her for waking me up. Because basically, I thought, I thought that I was probably doing OK, until this person came up and said, wake up. You are totally in the wrong vibration. And so from that point, when I see myself, I make it a point to apologize to people because I realize that I think I've made progress and yet I still see some of that same stuff come up. So 
And at this point in time, it's very good, because there's one lady in the kitchen who will come up to me, and she will constantly, I mean, it doesn't happen every day, but when it does happen, she comes and she says, I don't like to be talked to this way, or whatever it might be. And it's very good, because then, and we have a good relationship, so she just talks to me and she says, you know, this isn't the way to do it. And then we, and then we talk about it, and then we go, I go on. But it was like this was the first real wake up to make me open my eyes about where I am not. Thank you. You're getting there fast, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there faster. Mother and friends, I'd like to talk about a uh, major confrontation I had with Pride in the last six months. I'd also like to, at the end, tell about um, two people who apologized to me and how affected I was by it. Um, what you said in the beginning of, of Darshan here, Mother, about us, we've, some of us have been around for a while. It's probably one of our things we can be most vulnerable at, especially if we've been doing a particular profession for a while and figure we're pretty expert at it. I've been doing my job for about, oh, about 14, 15 years, so I figure I'm pretty good at it. Um, so I had a failing in this uh, in the last six months. Prior to this incident, I found that I was, um, in retrospect, irritated at just life in general um, and quite dissatisfied with myself. And so I guess these were uh, two things that presaged what was to come about in my life. And I want to let you know the keys that I learned in this incident because they're extremely valuable to me. Uh, what did happen was uh, I put in a long day's work and, and for some, um, I had to work quite late that day, quite late. So I went to bed very late, uh, very early in the morning and um, I, rece I received a phone call to tell about some work I had to do and I figured this was, this was, uh, uh, this basically shouldn't be happening. I, you know, I'd worked late, I'd done all this stuff and why was I getting this call? And I really proceeded to chew out the, uh, the operator that called me. And um, I figured I was in some sort of position to, to lecture this person about what they, uh, what they were doing, what exactly they uh, were conveying to me and whether it was appropriate. And I really gave them a piece of my mind because I, uh, I figured it wasn't right. And in retrospect, what I saw in that is I actually saw myself, and I didn't see it at the time. It had to be pointed out to me because I was completely oblivious to it. But I saw myself in the position to um, be in the position to judge that person and what they did because what I knew or what I thought I knew. Um, anyhow, as this proceeded on, um, fortunately God loved me enough or was disgusted enough with what I did that uh, he made sure that you found out what I had done. And you, uh, what astounded me is that within, I think, a very short while of you finding out this, you uh, contacted me, uh, and this was late at night. This was now late that evening. And it was like you were pursuing me like the hound of heaven trying to find me to let me know before the sun set on this day what I had done. And at that point, I really was not aware of even how I affected that person. Um, as it turned out, I was actually in, um, in transit, and so I wasn't near a phone. So you gave this message to, to my wife. And she came home and said, uh, I've got a message for you. So I said, um, uh, you need to sit down. So I sat down. And <laughs> uh, it was a very serious message about um, where I was in consciousness and what I had done to this person. And probably one, two, several things happened out of this. Uh, even though you didn't speak to me directly, I, I felt the fire come through. It was, it was a, a most interesting thing. I could feel the seriousness of this come through the words that my wife read to me. And I realized it was a very serious message, that it was uh, a time to assess what I was doing in my life, where I was. It was a soul initiation. I really felt that. Uh, the other thing that was very important for me to know was how I affected the other person, because up to that point, um, I did not realize how I affected that other person. And that's, this was, to me, key, because I figured it was just part of, the, uh, part of the process. But when I realized how much I had affected the other person, it really 
it really woke me up to the pain I caused that person. And to me, that was a major key to understanding this thing, this beast. It's almost like this, uh, this Rubik Cube puzzle. Uh, it, it was another aspect that you can get a handle on it. And until I saw that, I really couldn't appreciate that this thing was something that had to go. If I saw it within my own world, I could somehow live with it. But when, it, when I saw the pain it caused others, this is where it became uh, something I couldn't live with. Anyhow, uh, I think the other part of this test is I was so locked into how I thought I, I knew better than this person that um, the other sort of surprise, probably the only person I would have heard this from would be from you, Mother. I'm sure if this person told me, hey, this isn't the way to speak, I probably would not have accepted it at that, that time. And that unfortunately was a, a point of pride too because it took you giving the message for me to actually to wake up and hear this. Anyhow, it was very sobering for me. I, I looked deeply within and um, I ref wrestled with that a good period of the night. And I assessed myself and decided I was not happy with how I was treating this person and other people in a similar way. So I'm glad you said this is an ongoing process because it's something I did wrestle with and I felt a certain release up from. Well, once I made the decision, okay, this is going to go. This is going to go. I actually felt, and even though I had also gotten a discipline out of this, and I had gotten major chastisement, once I had decided, okay, this is going to go, I felt incredible joy and felt I was, in fact, I was, I was elated. And I said, this is ridiculous. You've received a major chastisement. You really caused a problem. And yet, when I let go of this thing, I felt absolutely elated. Did you feel loved because you were chastened? Oh, yes. See, this is the, that's the major revelation. That this is, is the major this is revelation. The major, I'm telling you, I, I felt like standing up and telling everybody, look, you know, pursue chastisement. I mean, <laughs> I mean this, this really, to me, I mean, this, this was such a revelation. And, um, but the joy doesn't come until you let go of that thing you're chastised with. If you're holding on to it, it's agony. Oh, it's just horrible. Um, the other key is, is uh, in the process of this, uh, I was assessed by some people. And um, I want to repeat the thing that you said earlier is uh, somebody brought up the concept, well, instead of having this fault, replace it with a virtue, and which is exactly what you said just a little while ago. And that, to me, was also very valuable because it got beyond the point of don't do this. Instead, do this positive thing. And you're somehow just, you, you can only get up to neutral by not doing this. To, to add to, the, to it with the quality, you actually get somewhere ahead of the game. That's really all I've got to say because it's, um, as you've told us, an ongoing battle. And uh, two things that happened, um, people apologized to me that very, very, very much impressed me. Um, I actually forget sort of the details of the incident, but I remember there was some difficulty I had with somebody. And um, this person came to me later, very quickly, very quickly, and apologized to me uh, very sincerely. And I was so impressed by that. Um, because they easily could have taken the position that, well, you know, really, you, that's your opinion, this is my opinion, and so on. But they, they came back and graciously, uh, not, you know, begrudgingly, but graciously, like they were giving you a platter or a gift or, or something like that. And I was so impressed by the, the caliber of this person's soul. I, I really could like, it was like opening a door and looking down a hallway with many things in it. I could actually see the depth of that soul. And it, it very much impressed me. It wasn't like I felt, you know, okay, I won the argument or something like that. I don't even think, I can't even recall exactly what we were doing. But the part that sticks with me is being impressed by this person's uh, rapidity and willingness to apologize abundantly. And that took humility. Yes, it did. And let's all remember that pride goeth before a fall. Mm -hmm. It's a warning. Mm -hmm. Pride goeth before the fall. So if you're so duly warned by that statement from the scripture, you already know your pride is there and you're going to fall unless you quickly reverse the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. Just saying that for the benefit of everyone here. Thank you. And the second, second person apologized to me. Um, I, we haven't spoken in many years much. I guess it's, um, 
we don't see each other much, and I, I, we haven't particularly, I think, had a, a good relationship. But recently, this person began to talk to me very friendly and, and very um, kindly and inquiring about what I'm doing and, and being very kind. And I was kind of startled by this. And I remember talking to this person, looking at him, and for the first time in my life, and I've known this person probably 18 or 19 years, looking at him and realizing for the first time what clear, bright blue eyes he had. Can you believe that? In 19 years, I've never really realized that. <laughs> it just astounded me, and I was very impressed by, uh, uh, by his friendliness. Thank you, Mother. Thanks for the opportunity to, to witness to. Thank you. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have pride, and as I was sitting in my chair and you had told us to think about something, I said, well, geez, I know I need to be up here. I've got to think about that there's got to be something. And as I started thinking about a couple examples that came to my head, I started realizing how they all came together and what they really meant. And um, what I realized is that uh, this pride, whatever form it takes, really hinders you. And um, one of the first times I ever encountered you was at the TRK, and I was serving you. And, um, and I've had a lot of waitressing experience, maybe too much more than I care to admit to. And, uh, and you told me, you know, you're being disruptive, can't you see that my fork and knife are on the plate? Take the plate away. You don't need to ask. Are you done? And, and I, you know, I, okay. I, I took the plate away. And then I went over to the other waitresses, and I was talking about the situation. And I said, well, you know, I know how to waitress. And, and not everyone's done with their food when they have their fork and knife on the plate. And, and you know, all these things are going through my head. And um, one of the waitresses that had served you before said, well, what you need to do is when you're serving mother, you need to really get in tune with her and her needs and her Holy Christ self and, and, and try to, you know, figure those things out so you don't need, you know, to be so, oh, are you done, you know, and, and be disruptive. So there was that lesson that I know I can apply now because of my new job, and um, I, didn't, I didn't think about it before because I let all my own whatever get caught up in what was trying to be um, taught there. And then uh, this past holiday... Um, can, I, can I finish? help finish this story? Certainly. Because I'd like to explain to all of you who may at one time or another be waiters, waitresses working in the, in the ranch kitchen or wherever, that um, the point of serving is to be serving with such um, gentility and respect for people talking, having their conversations, that they don't even notice you. But if you want to be noticed, you start talking to the customers. And, and you would never do this in, in a fine restaurant. It just wouldn't happen. And it truly is a signal to the waiter or waitress that you have finished what you're going to eat off that plate. And there might be still some food on it, or it might be empty. But when the knife and fork and spoon lie across the, the dinner plate in the center, you don't have to say anything to the person that you're waiting on because it, it is the, the way we behave in Western civilization. And this ability to put guests in our restaurant at ease and not carry on a lot of palaver with them when they come in contributes to their sense that we have that gentility and that sensitivity that when people are talking, you don't just come along and say, are you through? Can I take your plate? When it's obvious that's what you're supposed to be doing. So since we're going to be opening, some of you are going to be waiters and waitresses. <laughs> and this is one of the things that I think are important. This was the wedding, right? Yeah. So this was um, McNabb's wedding. And people were very much engaged in conversation. and. Uh, it, you know, it was a, a reception for them, and so it makes our restaurant look like a diner to have to always be talking at the help because you don't realize that um, you can do a lot to, to clear away dishes and not even be noticed, and that's the idea. When we're servants, we don't want to be noticed, and so we follow the rules of etiquette, and then 
The waitress doesn't have to talk to us. The waiter doesn't have to talk to us. And that means that we need to know the etiquette that says, okay, if you're through, put your knife and fork in the center of the plate. So I, I hope that happens, and I hope we get a, a, cut, a cut above where we have been in, in waiting so that, that people will recognize that we have a certain refinement in, in our understanding of, of serving the public. Great. Um, to continue with what I was saying, um, this past holiday, I uh, went with some friends cross-country skiing, and I noticed myself getting really irritated with one person just because they couldn't keep up with the rest of us. And, and so I was, oh, you know, and going back and circling around, and, and you know, I want to keep moving because this is my time, my exercise. And then I'm thinking later on, wow, I feel really bad because... I know what it's like not to be able to keep up when other people are more advanced and, and why I was so caught up with my frustration that I didn't even think, well, why don't I go back there and try to give her a few pointers or, or, or try to help her out so she can get better, so she could keep up. And um, so, again, that pride, well, you know, here, I'm fast, I'm good, and, and this person's not as, you know, up to level not becoming the Christ, not going back and helping so that she could, you know, come up to our level as well. Um, and then one more example, um, just being critical of people. Just, uh, there was a person that I work with, um, and inside, a lot of it goes on in the mind, you know, looking them up and down, noticing this or that about them, and, and, um, and then when I got to really know this person, I realized how beautiful they really were. And I felt really bad that I would even think of those things because I didn't know them. I was having these critical thoughts. And, and, and now when I see this person, it's like, wow, you know, you're just so great. You're just such a beautiful person. And, and everything else that had come to mind was just, you know, it, it, that all those aspects of pride, you know, just hindered me from learning, from serving, from loving. And so, um, I'd like to admit to that and, and apologize um, to anyone that I may have uh, treated that way, whether they were aware of it or not. And uh, since I am here to love and serve and learn, I'm hoping that all of you as my friends can point these things out to me, you know, and hopefully I'll be gracious. <laughs> if not, you could point that out to me too. But um, anyways, thank you. What, what Moria is saying at the end of your statement is that criticism is a curse. When you criticize someone, you are mentally cursing them. And I don't think anyone in this room looks at himself and says, I curse people. When you condemn people, you are cursing them. When you are judging them, you are cursing them. So that's quite an indictment against all of us. So. We mentally criticize, and we verbally criticize. It's the two ways we do it. We know that's the only two ways we have. But um, the minute we see ourselves doing it, we have to have available to ourselves ready thought forms, like we have a bouquet of cut-out flowers on the wall. And the minute we realize we're criticizing someone, we have to immediately send them tremendous love and call on the law of forgiveness. Or that will accrue to our karma that might be, just might be the level of karma where we don't make our 51% because of the CCJ, because it comes straight out of hell, death and hell. That's where it comes from, nowhere else. God doesn't criticize, judge, and condemn you ever. He will discipline you, he will chasten you, but he will not CCJ you. So who's doing it then? Your carnal mind and the dweller. Don't accept it. Don't dish it out. Cut yourself free. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, mother and friends. I'll make this very short. I was reading a note that I had written on my desk that I had on my desk since April, and it was from a dictation by Archangel Michael, and it said, "Let humility be your byword." So I just ran to my office to print out the page so I could read this quote to you. And I realized why I had taken this to heart so much when I heard this dictation. 
And it's because about 10 years ago, Mother, you had told me that I needed to heal the rents in my garment. So um, I, I think that this quote is very profound, and it made me realize that perhaps pride is a cause for creating the rents in our garment. So here is the quote. It's from April 4th, 1996, from the Easter Conference by Archangel Michael. And so, beloved, understand that where there are rents in the garment, let them be healed. Let them be healed, I say, and accept that healing as you perform those good works and enter into a pact with God that humility shall be your byword. And in the power, the stupendous power of humility, that self-effacement, therefore, let God fill all of your being and know that, and know that very tight oneness with the Maha Chohan, the Holy Spirit. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. What this path all comes down to is the Maha Chohan and the Holy Spirit. We need to put more effort into getting the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've all read enough books uh, by Christians who are very devout, beautiful people. We've learned from their teachings. We've learned when we've seen them on television. Some of them are phonies, and some of them are very great souls. But what is really going to make this, this organization fly is that we call for and receive and internalize the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not abide in us and with us constantly if we are not sending forth love to all people. Our techniques, such as dealing with CCJ, dealing with pride, dealing with all these things, are, are much more um, complex and incisive than the simple Christian teachings, which is why their one problem, their Achilles heel, is that they uh, are opened to demons because they have an inordinate desire to have the Holy Spirit. Mark Prophet told me that many, many years ago. Their desire is inordinate. So all they want is the Holy Spirit, and because they don't take that Holy Spirit gradually, as we do, stepping up the ladder, step by step, to receive that Holy Spirit, to retain it, to live in it, to be with it all of our lives. Um, it, if we wouldn't do that, we wouldn't have the successes we're having and what happens to the Christians is that because their desire for the Holy Spirit is inordinate, then demons come into them instead of the Holy Spirit. And that's tragedy. And then they get all mixed up as to whether the demons are of the Holy Spirit or the demons are not demons. I, I think most of the time they don't even recognize that they have demons. And that is a shame. But... What will bring people to the mountain of God is each one of us embodying the Holy Spirit and each one of us sending forth signals of divine love. People read our auras from across the planet. They assess us very easily at inner levels. Divine love meets every human need and the presence of the Holy Ghost within us is necessary, absolutely necessary to the success and the expansion of our church. People want transformation. They want God. They want love. And we need to be pillars of the sacred fire of divine love walking the earth. Everyone is, of you here is a magnet for that love. Or you repel that love because you'd rather carry your pride or your hatred or anger, your prejudice, or this or that. We can't have both. We have to want the Holy Spirit with all our heart and soul and mind and purge ourselves of all remnants of human consciousness where we have flashes of hatred or flashes of anger or flashes of pride that deprive us of our victory in that moment. There are many holy people in this earth who truly have the Holy Spirit and do not have demons. They're beautiful souls in all the world's religions. 
I think that because, as the Bible says, to him that is given much, much is expected. And we have been given much and almost take it for granted. But the goal of this path is the Holy Ghost. And when you're infilled with the Holy Ghost, you will know new levels of empowerment as your being is purged from any leftover human consciousness material. This is when we will be of the most value to the Ascended Masters, to El Moria, to Saint Germain. When we defer to the Holy Spirit and we prefer the Holy Spirit above all else, we're willing to give up everything else to know that when we walk and move among the people, we have a mantle, and those who are of the light recognize it, and they will follow us all the way to this mountain of God at Maitreya's Mystery School. So it's almost like we have just begun, and everything else is prologue. The past is prologue. Now we have to step at that level and stay there and heal the world through divine love, not excluding, but definitely inserting the power of the ruby ray, the ruby ray masters, the ruby ray judgments, and really going after every force of anti-love with Jamuel and charity. I'm going to give an invocation that you might receive this Holy Spirit. Please stand. Beloved, mighty I am presence from the heart of God and the great central sun, we, your servants, stand before this altar of God that you have prepared for us in the wilderness. We look to you, our beloved Maha Chohan, as the incarnation of the Holy Ghost to the entire world. We say to you, to the Darjeeling Council, to all hosts of light, we have tarried long enough, hard enough. We are ready to move to the next stages of our development, to the place where we might embody a greater portion of our threefold flame, no intense communion with our holy Christ self, walk and talk with our mighty I am presence. Let there be no division between heaven and earth. Let there be only the rejoicing of our hearts that we have seen everything of this world. There is very little of it that we wish to have a part of. But that part that we deeply desire to have, O oh, beloved Holy Spirit, is your presence, even in the very depths of our being, as you groan within us to deliver us, to purge us, to bring us to that point and that moment where each one of us here can kneel before the altar of our God and go to that Holy Spirit and know that we might be received, we might have that mantle, we might have that presence, whereby we are no longer in the confinements of our mortality, but we have chosen to be immortals, and in that immortality that we might have that Holy Ghost in us, O God. Therefore, this night we ask for increased chastening, purging, quickening, in the very understanding that we have that empowerment through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we want to be in the very heart of the Holy Spirit to see this planet through to the victory. We thank thee, O God. We accept it done this hour in full power. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, I seal each one in King Arthur's court, each one on the patch throughout the world. I seal you in the heart of the Holy Spirit, and I ask you to diligently purge from heart, mind, and soul all that would prevent you from receiving the Holy Ghost and abiding in your temple till the hour of the, your ascension. This is the goal and your ultimate victory to be one with that spirit. We thank thee, O God, and together we say, command ye me. 
we call upon you, almighty God, and we command you to bring order into this planet, order into this church, divine love in every heart, cut free the children, bind the forces of the Satan and their seed. Let the victory of God be upon us and let us be worthy of it. We accept it on this hour in full power. Amen. <laughs>